That's good too. So then my name is Mr. Max Chaudhary of Chaudhary Law Office. I'm a Canadian immigration lawyer in based in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I've been in the immigration practice law since I believe August 1993, I believe, right? And the idea behind this webinar is to uh, try to give some general guidance about immigration issues for Canada because the uh, the phenomenon of web searching is becoming more and more complex. Google itself is not really helpful in these searches unless you're extremely good at searching. And immigration fora are everywhere and are in different languages. And sometimes they have good information, but oftentimes they do not. And sometimes there are rumors about some policy or other that may uh, have started from a potential statement by a sitting minister, and it might have led to the impression that there is a policy or program or a pathway or some kind of status or privilege like permanent residency, which does not in fact exist. So I have these webinars every, usually on the third Thursday of every month. And uh, I want to provide some general guidance as opposed to uh, substantive advice because substantive advice requires, uh, what is the cliche, a deep dive into the circumstances of the person and their related parties, such as family members, or in some cases, employers, or in some cases, the police, depending on the nature of their visa query. But nevertheless, what I want to do is encourage you to pose now some questions in the chat. We have a few people. Uh, we'll see how that works. If some people, um, you know, as the nature of these things are, some people may come and go during the course of this. And uh, that may provide some opportunity for a bit more in-depth discussion of one matter versus another matter, depending on the scope of questions. So by all means, please pose some questions uh, in the chat. If uh, need be, I may ask for more detail. And then uh, in my discretion, I may ask the person to speak uh, on the webinar if they're uh, consenting to that because this is being recorded. And this may be used for marketing purposes, hence the reason that this is general guidance and not substantive advice. So I don't see any questions now, but I want to uh, start until uh, until I do see some questions. Uh, the The one big issue that is coming now and shall increase uh, is uh, as of July 2024, there have been articles in the media talking about the quantity of removals in the past year, exceeding, I believe, all of the removals in the past 10 years. And that may be a sign, you could take it either way. Uh, from a political vantage point, it may be the uh, assertion that the current government, which has been in power for nine years or so, has failed to allocate resources for the removal of people. But suffice it to say now, they are, with the passage of COVID, uh, accelerating these deportations. And uh, from my point of view, the priority for these deportations is typically people with a criminal record that's not to say that they are the only people being deported. Other people being deported would include long-standing persons in Canada without status who are deportable. And you may want to know how is the criteria determined for somebody who can be deported? It's very fact specific. So for example, can they get a passport to their country of origin? Uh, is that country of origin not on the list of countries where we cannot deport people to? I think uh, one example I think is like Sudan. You cannot really deport persons to Sudan unless maybe there's serious criminality. And 
Uh, there are other factors as well, which relate to the allocation of resources directed to who is going to get deported in the next presumably uh, 12 months, which may coincide with the next election. And this may uh, be uh, for the purpose of showing that there is uh, an immigration policy that will please a broader swath of Canadians and permanent residents here in Canada. So that's that's something which I've read and which I've encountered in our practice, not just in the news, but we're getting many queries about deportation, which at least in the greater Toronto area means that we have to make trips, physical trips to 6900 Airport Road, entrance 2B or entrance 93, and uh, in some cases request to defer removal uh, to delay removal. And if anybody's in that situation, I can talk about that later. But in the meantime, I do see a question. And the question relates to humanitarian and compassionate or H and C cases. An H and C case is in process right now. The biometrics request was issued and been complied with by the candidate for the H and C. And then the other question is, what is the next step, I presume, and what is the minimum or maximum processing time uh, based on the experience that we see and perhaps based on the, uh, the processing time that they may publish. So in terms of the next steps now, in contrast to perhaps um, uh, maybe a year ago, there seems to be a longer delay for humanitarian and compassionate or agency decisions being decided. And that could simply be uh, an allocation of resource issue. Uh, we don't, uh, I don't have ready access to the amount or the quantity of H and C applications, which may have been filed in the past year. My suspicion is based on the queries I'm getting that there are persons who were aspiring to get permanent residency through the skilled pathway, such as express entry, express entry subcategory CEC. And now the points are too high for that. Uh, the general draws, I mean, and the general draws are being held fewer and fewer times and that has put persons who have uh, been in that CEC profile, namely persons who might have studied for two years, then gotten a work permit th for three years, and then may have been here during COVID and got a policy-based extension of their work permit for another 18 months. And now, um, in contrast to the persons they may have known who immigrated or not immigrated, but may have entered this pathway two years earlier, uh, they're left with uh, no pathway for PR in sight unless they are uh, working in a STEM job or a healthcare job. So that may be one source for the increase, uh, from my understanding, the increase in humanitarian compassionate applications. So that leads to the next question, which is what is the expected time frame? or H and C applications. One thing which is a bit troubling is that the in the past uh, three or four months, there is uh, this uh, association with uh, basic elements of life in Canada, such as availability of housing, cost of rent, uh, compounded by inflation matters. And uh, then there are specialized experts saying that the increase of the quantity of people in Canada has uh, not led to a net increase in economic productivity. And all of that is pointing to uh, the uh, assertion, which I think is becoming a bit louder, that too many people were let in during the uh, times in which there were low points for express entry such as in, I believe, February 2021, where the points were as low as 75 points. So my understanding 
based on what I see is that I, I myself in our office, we have uh, two or three cases which now have passed the one year mark. So, and we've come across other colleagues on our discussion groups with other lawyers saying that there are delays for agencies. So it may very well be that it would surpass the 1.5 mark at the minimum for an H and C application to be processed to conclusion. So there may be a follow-up for that, but I, I will go through the questions in order. And then um, if there's a related question that can be posted in the chat and I can give a slightly more contextual answer to that. But I see another question and this one is relating to parent, parental immigration. And the posed question is, my sister is a Canadian citizen. My mother is a US citizen. How difficult is it to get Canadian permanent resident status uh, in that, uh, I suppose, that set of family circumstance? And then is it faster for a US citizen? And how long does that take? So if we break down the uh, facts divulged in the question, there is a Canadian um, citizen. The sister of the person is a, a Canadian citizen. and. The mother is a US citizen. And then uh, it sounds like the person asking the question is a US citizen. And based on that, is there any special circumstance for US citizens to get permanent residency? So the special treatment for US citizens is uh, encompassed in part by the treaty used to be called NAFTA. Now I believe it's called CUSMA. And I believe the United States Immigration Department has a different name for it. But what that does is for US citizens who have work experience and education on a, a certain list, uh, they're allowed to work in Canada based on just having a job offer corresponding with what is on that list. And that's uh, you may think well that's only a work permit well i mean when we when we scratch that a bit further then if you do have the job offer you can work for one year in canada and working for one year in canada can make you eligible to file a cec application you may be thinking if you listened earlier that the points for cec are very high so then then what do you do so in this case, if we have a hypothetical U.S. citizen based on USMA getting a job offer, it's conceivable in that scenario that if the employer did offer you a job to work for one year, they may support your CEC application for permanent residence uh, by giving you an offer of a job that's indeterminate, namely a job that they, they will indicate uh, in a further job offer that after you work for one year, you file your CEC profile and then they write a letter saying they intend to employ you for at least one year after you acquire permanent residency. And in some cases, if they file um, uh, an LMIA, not a, not a full LMIA, but a, uh, a shorter version of an LMIA without the government fee, et cetera, then that can add 50 points minimum 200 points if it's an executive level job, but that's kind of rare. That's like CEO, that sort of thing. So that could be a pathway distinguishing US citizens from other people. And of course you get points if you do have a sister who's residing in Canada under the uh, express entry uh, inventory management grid, as opposed to the other uh, selection points. With that, I believe disposed of, let me see. Um, if uh, I'll just reread that again, make sure I've answered the question as posed, uh, at least in the circumstances I have. But again, I mean, if there's a follow up, pose it in the question chat box again, because I do see another question here, which is I entered Spain on a tourist visa and then applied for a residency for a year. And on the, I presume they're talking about the Canadian address and travel history section. Do I include Spain in the travel section? for the first months, and then Spain as residency address once residency has been granted. So this, this question relates to what level of specificity do you 
uh, impart on the immigration application forms. And then the immigration application forms have to be read with their question. The question has to be interpreted with a plain and ordinary meaning. So on address and travel history, you should take that at face value. You were traveling to Spain. You had uh, visitor status. Uh, you made an application for changing your status in Spain. The presumption, from my understanding, is that it was merely an application and that you merely only retained tourist or visitor visa status in Spain. The bottom line is um, you were residing in Spain, if we take the plain and ordinary meaning. So you should declare that in the immigration forms and try to be consistent this uh, issue of consistency comes up, for example, with skilled worker applications where there is a personal history form and then there's a work experience form. And some people uh, may not include all the work experience in the work history form, but they should in the personal history form. So that's sort of an analogy for that. And I think I see a follow-up for the previous question, a bit more context about the US uh, citizen uh the context is that the mother the candidate is 84 years of age and wants to be there with her daughter and is basically unemployable and is a u.s citizen and so that is the the new fact uh which would modify what was said before because the presumption before was that the candidate was working age and clearly this person is not so because of the de facto uh pause on the parental sponsorship program, the daughter who's a Canadian citizen cannot avail herself of the ordinary uh, parental sponsorship program. So what does that leave? Then the, the issue is if the person's a US citizen, uh, the reality is uh, there's uh, a lot worse countries to for the citizen uh, to be residing in and the uh the desire to be in canada would have to uh be uh supplemented by issues of economic establishment economic establishment doesn't mean making a great living it merely means not being a burden on the state but this is extremely important for an elderly person because Anybody who is, well, I mean, the life expectancy is a little unpredictable uh, to some extent, but nevertheless, the, uh, the person is uh, without permanent residency. They, uh, if they're in Canada, they, they cannot have the ability to work. The question would be, what is the support network in Canada? There's a Canadian citizen daughter. Uh, what's the purpose of assessing the support network? Well, that can be used to allow a person to show that they have the resources to remain as a visitor. In some cases, with a lot more information, uh, they could conceivably uh, file a humanitarian compassion application. But at the outset, you would have a huge stumbling block because if the person's a U.S. citizen, uh, there is nothing stopping you from uh, the Canadian daughter sending money to support the U.S. citizen in the United States. Uh, you could counter that with some peculiarity, some uniqueness about the relationship, uh, such as the absence of relatives in the United States and uh, the uh, demonstrated ability of the Canadian citizen daughter to support, to address that economic establishment element for the 84-year-old potential H and C candidate. You still have to address hardship. So hardship in the United States, I mean, there's different levels of socioeconomic uh, status in the United States, uh, but, and there's different levels of wealth in each area of the United States. The uh, certain states are more wealthy than others. Some have a more, more robust social safety net, others do not. Those issues would have to be addressed because the officer will take the presumption that there is 
an ability for an 84-year-old to reside in the United States. So it would be a very complex situation uh, for that. So I, I think that's that was sort of the follow-up. And then another question is, uh, is a visitor visa holder able to apply for asylum or refugee inside of Canada? And for this, uh, somebody who is inside of Canada can apply for refugee uh, through the tribunal, the Refugee Protection Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board. One question that would come up is how long has the person been inside of Canada? And what is the nature of the uh, threat in the country of origin, which is usually the country of citizenship? And that would lead to a whole array of questions, such as who is the agent of persecution? And are the authorities able to address the uh, danger posed by the agents of persecution? The presumption is that if it is a democratically elected country, then there is a presumption that the government can protect you from the agent of persecution. So that could lead to further questions about whether there is some degree of corruption in the authorities, such as the police. Uh, is there some, uh, some instability in the country which is targeting a particular minority? Uh, or such as a you know, political uh, uh, partisan member or a religious minority? Uh, or do they have some other unique characteristic? For example, are they, um, do they look unusual? Like uh, there is a, um, uh, in some cases, there are asylum claims from Iran who base it on the fact that they're albino and that they cannot really live based on their physical appearance. Uh, that's another factor as well. Further factors include, uh, if you're on a visitor visa, when you came to Canada, how long did you wait to make a refugee claim? Why did you wait if it was more than six months? Uh, is there a strong subjective fear, i.e. a fear subjectively in your mind? Uh, can that be reconciled with the fact that you did not make a refugee claim in a timely way? Maybe it could. On the other hand, if you were here for in Canada for six or 12 months even, uh, was there some event that took place affecting somebody similarly situated to you, like a family member or a political party member. And did that cause fear, despite you being in Canada for a long time? Maybe. So refugee law is extremely complicated. Uh, even federal court judges have talked about how complex refugee law is uh, in the context of uh, complaining about the uh, cuts to legal aid but that's a separate matter. It's just meant to show the complexity of asylum or refugee law across the world for that. So uh, that's, I think I've disposed of that question in a relatively comprehensive way. Uh, the, but you'll notice the answer basically means that there are further questions that would have to be uh, answered to get to the sort of nub of the matter, which is, is there merit? to a refugee claim in Canada. So uh, with that being said, I, I don't see any other questions at the moment. So uh, at this point, the um, I, earlier I spoke about the phenomenon of increasing uh, deportations from Canada. And uh, another recent uh, issue relates to this ongoing use of artificial intelligence by the immigration department. And primarily, uh, thus far, it seems it's for temporary applications like visitor visas, study permits, and I believe in some cases, work permits. Uh, these cases are the types where there is a huge volume of applications and the immigration department wants to uh, find a way to deal with that huge volume of applications with, with some assistance. The issue though, however, is that the artificial intelligence is not very, let's call it robust, which is a popular IT term. 
And practically speaking, at least in its earlier iterations from 2021, what tended to happen is a visitor uh, visa candidate or study permit candidate would have an elaborate set of documents to show, for example, in the case of a visitor, extensive travel history to various countries, both developed and less developed, uh, strong ties to their home country, such as a spouse or a business, and ample funds. And the issue has become, at least earlier on, that the documents were digested by artificial intelligence and were not really uh, summarized in a proper way, leading to the officer looking at the summary of the documents and saying, I don't think this person would be granted a visitor visa. Another analogous situation is where there was maybe one visitor visa refusal in the past, maybe even five or 10 years ago. And just based on that, the existing, the existence of a visitor visa, the application gets refused very quickly, which is practically speaking, ignoring any documents and application forms that were filed in support of the visitor visa application. And then there's kind of a vicious cycle because if you refuse once, the AI might refuse you again automatically. And then you have to consider what is the course of action in that case. Strictly speaking, it's reconsideration or federal court. Out of the two, reconsideration in that scenario would be unsuitable because it's quite likely that you may not get an answer or you may get an answer quickly that again would be no. Just based on the previous analysis, which was assisted by the truncated summary generated by AI. So then the other option in that case would be federal court, but federal court is expensive and you have to weigh the purpose of the visit in relation to the cost. Maybe you don't want the stigma of a visa refusal when you travel the world, because in other countries, when you apply for their visas, they may ask you, have you ever been refused a visa anywhere? You'd have to say yes. In that case, you may be incentivized to take the case to federal court when there's merit to uh, overturn that refusal and have it reassessed. So that is the um, uh, a phenomenon which is increasing a lot these days. Uh, I don't know if it's, um, I, I heard, I don't know if this is, this is confirmed, I heard that it's going to be deployed for common law and spousal sponsorship permanent residency as well, but I'm not 100% certain about that. But that may be, um, uh, that's an even more complex fact situation, the origin of a marriage, et cetera, genuineness of a marriage. So that, that may be very challenging. But anyways, let's see if we have any further question. Uh, so can I show an online bank uh, as proof of funds for express entry? Okay, so that's a very specific question relating to documents. So express entry, if you look at the, um, the subsequent stage, the invitation to apply stage, then that would lead to a document list generated by the uh, immigration department on the website. And if I recall, it's quite specific that there is a distinction between merely an online statement and an official monthly bank statement. If I recall correctly again, an online statement lacks any security features and it is just a screenshot uh, by contrast, a bank statement is something formally generated by the bank used for very specific substantive purposes, like perhaps bookkeeping and accounting and tax returns. And it is much safer to use an official bank statement from the bank rather than just taking screenshots of the monthly activity. That, that would not be sufficient most of the time uh, for this. And that, that ties into uh, a common issue with immigration, which is uh, they provide a document list. Maybe it's comprehensive for 80% of the people. The other 20%, they may have a unique situation, which is not addressed in the document list. And then it's up to them to make a judgment call about 
how to address that issue. So for example, maybe there was a, a criminal interaction in the past and it was more than five years ago. And as a result, you'd have to say yes when answering the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And then there'd be a space for that. But on the other hand, what if you met the requirements for a deemed rehabilitation? Then in that case, the box may not be sufficient. You may have to get further evidence, such as a pardon from the jurisdiction where you were convicted or further documentation showing you completed the sentence for the sole crime you ever committed and related penalties and more than five years have elapsed. So it's one example, 20% of cases which may not fall within the document list required or imposed on everybody. Uh, other situations may include the, uh, in the case of skilled worker or CEC, if you have a, uh, a work experience setting that you were relying on and your work reference letter does not agree or comport with the parameters specified on the invitation to apply document list, then what do you do? You have to get supplementary information. So somebody in authority who can confirm uh, your employment there would have to hopefully write something in addition to the standard reference letter to fill in any gaps, such as job duties or hours worked or change in job title, et cetera. So again, uh, documentation sometimes is not fully explained on the standard document list for even these more objective types of immigration pathways, such as CEC or federal skilled worker. So something to keep in mind if you have a sort of unique set of circumstances. So with that in place, uh, I think that's sort of a more uh, follow-up to the uh, initial question posed there. And uh, in, in these types of situations generally, if I, if I sort of give an even bigger picture, there is this issue of onus or burden. The legal burden is on you, the candidate, to show that you comply with the law. That onus is um, assisted in part by the document list. And in some cases, you have to come up with more specific documentation. These are the more substantive, uh, objectively based uh, applications for visas or permanent residency. Uh, the other extreme is, uh, like we talked about earlier, humanitarian and compassionate, or H and C applications, where the document checklist is somewhat vague, and that's meant to accommodate the fact that the H and C category is meant as a kind of catch-all for persons who don't have a regular pathway to Canada, but are in Canada nevertheless, and deserve a more discretionary set of relief for the purpose of granting permanent residency. And then you really need some specialized expertise. Even if you have a strong sense of research or intuition, you still need the benefit of some expertise and experience to guide you about how to fashion the arguments based on the documents that you are able to obtain. And some of them can be so broad they can even be research documentation depending on the nature of the uh, argument you're making about for example hardship hardship in your home country that can kind of be blurred with the asylum or refugee criteria so it's again these more discretionary applications like humanitarian compassionate are somewhat more complicated so with that in mind, there's another question related to permanent resident cards. And somebody was in the process of trying to renew their permanent resident card for a long time and unable to submit it because the previous PR card was misplaced and the system doesn't accept the date. So this sounds like this person opted for the, um, I believe there's two ways of filing for the PR card. One is the mail and one is the online method. 
uh, if uh, if I remember correctly, the the paper method it might be a little bit slower, but you have the ability to get a bit more information in front of the officer. In certain situations, uh, you have to explain the absence of a required document for this. It sounds like, I mean, it's not 100% clear, but in this case, it sounds like uh, a new card was issued, but just something about that card, such as the issuance date or the circumstances around the finding of that replacement card were sufficiently different from the card it was meant to replace to make it difficult to input the data into the online permanent resident card application. So if there is an option for a paper filing, then that would be the way to go because then you could submit the permanent resident card and then explain the circumstances leading to this subsequent permanent resident card, which does not seem to be accepted through the online system. So that's one possible way to deal with this, but the explanation has to address what the circumstances was were that was beyond your control uh, related to perhaps the permanent resident card. So with that in mind, I mean, those are a sort of discrete question, but I see some further ones here, which is, uh, uh, this sounds like a particular uh, application or question related to status, marital or common law status. So the uh, is a cancellation paper from a previous common law relationship, a required document for an electronic application for permanent residence, uh, or is it optional? So in a, in a case of a common law status, it's kind of like marriage. So in a case where, for example, you entered into a new common law situation, then you want to have some clear break with the previous common law relationship. Similarly, if you um, get married, then that's a clear break uh, after uh, being in a common law relationship that was broken. So on the safe side, it's better to have some kind of uh, a third party document confirming the dissolution of the common law relationship, assuming that's available in the jurisdiction where the common law relationship took place, probably is. In some cases, that may manifest itself as uh, a separation agreement, talking about uh, assets in a very categorical way as a further element to show the dissolution of the common law relationship. Uh, in in that case, because it is express entry. Unfortunately, express entry, the invitation to apply system is not very forgiving. So it's they only give you 60 days for this. And if you don't have what is on the list, then they may simply say it was incomplete. Go back into the pool and resubmit the application. That could be prejudicial in cases where your age has increased since the previous application was invited to apply. Or let's say you have a child and the child now is over 22 and you want to resubmit the profile, then that child can no longer be part of your permanent resident application. So those are the extremely serious consequences uh, for not complying and in some narrow cases, anticipating the concerns of the immigration department. So some caution is advised and some Substantive attempts are advised in a general way to show the dissolution of that relationship. Uh, so with the with that in mind, there is a, a, an additional question, which is, uh, I have a visitor record that will expire by November 2024. So about three months from now. And the question is, how many times can I apply for a visitor record extension until an H and C case is decided? And so this relates to whether the officers dealing with the visitor record extensions, i.e. temporary status, are being comprehensive and diligent when looking at the overall circumstance of the candidate. They may or may not know that the person has filed an agency application. 
And in that situation, uh, the officer, if they find out, then they uh, they have to, if it's been raised, they should deal with the idea of dual intent. Dual intent is a doctrine that says a person could have a temporary intention as well as a permanent intention as expressed by an application for a permanent residency, such as a humanitarian compassionate application. There's other factors that the officer has to deal with, such as a robust ability to support oneself, such as substantial savings, since you cannot work in Canada on a visitor record, but also uh, ties to the home country and whether the person will leave if and this is the most fundamental question, arguably, whether the person will leave if their permanent resident case is refused. So that puts the officer in a bit of a dilemma, especially if the permanent resident slash H and C case is not disposed of or decided, because then the officer has to think, well, um, I'm not tasked as the visitor visa officer to look at the merits of the H and C case. All I'm doing is looking at the visitor visa case in some cases, they just simply give you the benefit of the doubt. It's a little bit discretionary. And then uh, I've seen in some cases people being able to stay. This is anecdotal, but some people have been able to extend twice and sometimes stay for two years, maybe three on a visitor record. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to give false hope because part of that might have been because of COVID. So that's somewhat recent history. And that fact situation of COVID is no longer with us. So that, the absence of COVID combined with the uh, changing public perception about immigration and the more sort of law and order uh, temperament that is percolating in the media, which is reflected in the public, may have an effect on the amount of times you can stay in Canada on temporary status. So something to keep in mind aside from the uh, anecdotes that um, have uh, arisen from the uh, lawyers in my office and other lawyers as well on the uh, discussion groups that uh, we have access to. So uh, with that, we still have we still have 15 minutes and uh, I encourage you to have any questions which I can attempt to answer and by all means pose them in the chat. If need be, I will ask for further detail during the course of the response uh, for these things. Uh, but I always like to talk about um, anybody who's available, just the, uh, the common issue, which we always find very disappointing, which is the, um, um, the uh, applications where people omit information, usually, at the end of one of the forms, they ask some yes or no questions and people sometimes sort of instinctively put no to everything. And that's extremely dangerous because that could lead to a five-year ban. So as a consequence, it's important to always read those questions carefully. And uh, those those situations can easily be prevented if you read them carefully and think carefully about your history. Similarly, and this this touches upon the uh, the earlier question, which related to um, the uh, uh, address history versus personal history, etc. You have to be comprehensive about the address history or personal history because address history is used to assess admissibility specifically if the amount of days you've been in one country exceed more than six months then you're required to get a police clearance and that depends on the type of application as well so if you're not comprehensive about that that could be a form of misrepresentation this omission of addresses similarly the omission of other names you might have used that could be an issue because the presumption is that you may have used a different name and the presumption maybe it might have been for an improper purpose and the failure to disclose those aliases could be construed as a form of inadmissibility leading to a five-year ban under the basis of misrepresentation uh, for this so uh, that is um well, maybe i'll take a look here if i see 
Uh, oh, so this relates to the visitor visa slash H and C question in the chat. And then, uh, so in the in the context of this, if we look at a bit more detail, then uh, the visitor record application indicates a pending H and C application. And there's nothing wrong with declaring that as long as you do show that if the agency is refused, your personal circumstances are such that you would leave if the permanent resident case is denied. There should be some sympathy on the part of officers dealing with uh, visitor records for parents who are in Canada only because um, the the fact that the permanent residency sponsorship program is paused means that by definition you're creating demand for parents to be in canada so what other legal avenue is there except to be more permissive on the visitor record extensions for parents in canada that sort of ties into the anecdotes i had about uh, the persons I've, I've come across who were granted extensions for two or three years they were older people and um, although COVID was a factor wouldn't have been the only factor because they they were um they were deporting people during COVID, just not as many because other countries would not necessarily have accepted them so but um, they were deporting people so it is a factor uh for this so in other words uh, some degree of transparency is fine as long as it's contextualized to show that you, the candidate, do have the profile that you would leave in the event a uh, a permanent resident application is refused uh, for this. Again, so that's sort of a somewhat more deeper dive into the idea of dual intention, which is, I think, Regulation 22 of the Immigration Refugee Protection Regulations. So you can look that up if you want to. Uh, get a bit more information about this, right? So, uh, so these these types of um, the the kind of theme that has run through some of these questions are not only related to permanent residency, but older people <laughs> getting permanent residency in Canada, not the economic working aged persons, but the the older ones who have now, um, based on policies and pauses of programs, are fallen through the cracks, and they do have Canadian citizen children, but the children have limited utility or ability to help them aside from super visas or visitor visas. The complaint being that the, uh, on the one hand, super visas are longer now, a five-year period, but on the other hand, depending on the health condition of the parent, the insurance per year may be exorbitant, uh, depending on the profile. So that leads to some frustration, and that it does lead to more humanitarian and compassionate applications for parents who uh, may have a solid profile for being in Canada, such as family members here, sufficient funds of their own um, support network through their family, uh, maybe even the ability to do some work in the, uh, the short or medium term, and maybe some difficulties related to the country conditions in their country of citizenship or country of origin. So with that in mind, I think still have time, right? Oh, somebody's popping in here. I'll just let them in. And... So somebody is posing a question. Uh, this looks like a somewhat hypothetical question, but let me see if I can digest this accordingly. So uh, I traveled by bus to country X by passing country Y and getting a stamp on my current passport from country Y. Shall I include it in the express entry travel history having passed by it for a few hours? So in this case, the short answer is more detailed is better. The issue, though, is that now these applications are online, so you have to make sure there's room or profiles when you input the information. If not, you have to find a different spot in the application. 
and sort of a residual or miscellaneous spot in your online electronic application to mention these circumstances. It's better that you do uh, whenever possible. Uh, that's sort of the short answer. Uh, so not always, but oftentimes the more disclosure, the better. Sometimes you have to be uh, using your own discretion because sometimes the scope of information needed to be disclosed does not have to be that comprehensive. And you may be prejudicing your application by disclosing too much information. So there is a balancing act you have to make a judgment call about. On the one hand, you want to frame your application in the best way possible by omitting things which you think are detrimental to your application. But on the other hand, you have to avoid failing to disclose material information. Otherwise, they could deem your application to uh, have a material misrepresentation by omitting relevant information for the purpose of their assessment. And their assessment would include admissibility. Admissibility would include uh, not uh, complying with laws of criminality or any other laws of another country, the immigration laws of another country not being complied with, um, um, and even just like I said earlier, just uh, exceeding a certain amount of days in a country triggering the need for a police clearance. So even though you may not have committed a crime, nevertheless, you may have to submit a police clearance uh, for these things. So that sort of is the, the short answer about what to disclose in the context of travel history for these uh, many types of these applications, the PR ones being somewhat more comprehensive than the others. This ties into another issue for people many times who have had a progression of applications in the past. So just like the CEC candidates, they started from study permit application and then maybe a study permit renewal and then a work permit under the um, auspices of the PGWP or post-graduation work permit. And then onward, hopefully after one year work experience to the express entry slash ITA slash electronic application for permanent residency. So you have a track record of applications. What if you didn't include a relevant fact on one of the ones in the past? And now you're at the sort of penultimate application, the permanent resident one. What if you needed to disclose something on the permanent resident application, such as work experience, which you did not disclose in your study permit application when you came to Canada? In this case, there are certain defenses under misrepresentation, the utility of which may vary from case to case. Sometimes there is an innocent mistake exception where you legitimately could not have anticipated the need to disclose uh, some particular work experience on your study permit, but nevertheless, you want to disclose it on your electronic application for permanent residency. Uh, so that has to be explained in such a way so as not to be deemed to be uh, Section 40 misrepresentation, otherwise that's the five-year ban. And in some cases, what that means is you have to try to show that there was no material or there would have been no material change to the uh, decision on the very first application you made, the study permit application, which got you into Canada. Had you disclosed this piece of information, which you're now disclosing in the application for the permanent residency. So some caution is always in order. Uh, with the phenomenon of electronic applications, you want to download whatever you have filed for these applications so that you are ensuring consistency with future applications such as renewals or changes of status from study to work permit or changes of status from work to permanent residency. So it's some caution is in order in uh, these kinds of situations. So we have a little bit of time left for this. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the uh, issue of misrepresentation 
for these types of applications. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. By all means, you can uh, pose them in the chat in the remaining time we have uh, for this. In the meantime, um, the uh, if if you read the news, the uh, pathway for um, student permits is kind of hampered by the need for a a uh, provincial attestation letter, which is making it's really another step to reduce the quantity of students in Canada, uh, which is causing some difficulties. Oh, I see something. I see somebody may want to pose um, a question. So uh, they can pose it uh, if they don't mind. This is being recorded. They can actually say the question <laughs> if they unmute themselves briefly, if that's faster, since we only have a couple of minutes left or simply just pose it in the chat, whatever is easier, just since the time is sort of limited, right? Um, I'll wait for that since we do have a little bit of time, right? And, but I do see a further question here, which is uh, I am currently in Canada and I came with a work permit that is valid until 2026. I've stayed only for four months and uh, my spouse is a student here and we have a newborn baby here and I now have a permanent job here. So uh, can I apply for a work permit? So in this situation, you have a work permit. It sounds like you can add more, more questions or more um, detail in the chat, but it might be there was some term and condition on the existing work permit that you wanted altered because some people come on closed work permits, i.e. work permits tied to a specific employer and some people less common than come on open work permits, such as under the international experience class. Uh, so uh, if you, the general rule is if you're in Canada and you have a study permit or a work permit in some cases or many cases, you can apply for a work permit while inside of Canada. And there are other exceptions too, like if you're coming under a C10 uh, kind of work permit, which is a work permit to start a business, you can oftentimes apply for that inside of Canada. So uh, there was like some some sort of correction. Okay, so applying for permanent residency. This is the question I've been dealing with. So uh, permanent residency inside of Canada, just by the, the existence of a, of a newborn baby, that in and of itself is not enough because, I mean, in a sense, that puts you in the category of... Um, I think the, I'm, I'm hoping that's a neutral term, birth tourism, where people come to Canada as visitors just to have a baby here. Um, so, I mean, I'm not saying that's your purpose because obviously you have a work permit. It's not yours, but it sort of vaguely resembles that. So without further um, uh, uniqueness to your situation, uh, then an H&C case, humanitarian compassionate, would not be suitable unless there is a sudden deleterious consequence in your country of origin, like you cannot return to your country. So with that in mind, um, uh, you may want to explore the, um, if possible, based on your profile of age, education, et cetera, explore express entry for that. And there is a hand posed or raised, signifying, I guess, an expression of a question, but we have some, we can go a little bit over if there's a question. Um, um, or at this point, if you want to, we only have maybe a couple of minutes left for this. Uh, somebody can unmute and then pose the question if they if they feel comfortable with that or simply. Uh, my question is, I have a permanent um, job here now. Can mm -hmm. I ask? I, um, for permanent PR based on the permanent job I, I've got here now. That's my okay, so there is a permanent job here, right? So in other words, the employer might be willing to say that I want to keep this person employed for more than one year after their granted permanent residency. Uh, if they do that kind of letter, then depending on the other aspects of your circumstance, such as age and education and work experience outside of Canada, that 
uh, job support letter by the employer. After one year, uh, maybe even before one year, if you have foreign work experience, uh, that could lead to 50 points if the employer does the labor market impact assessment meant to support permanent residents. It's a little bit less complicated than the standard labor market impact assessment because there's no um, $1,000 government fee. And I don't think they have to advertise if they're going to do an LMIA to support your potential permanent resident application. So something you want to discuss with the employer, I would say. And then also um, look at your circumstance, such as whether your age, work experience outside of Canada, language level, education, combined with the potential 50 points, might make you a suitable candidate for putting up an express entry profile now. And also the nature of the job. Is it a STEM job or healthcare job? So there's a few, fa a few factors you want to look at in, uh, in that situation. So. With that in mind, I think we're pretty well at time and I wanna thank you very much for spending the time here. I hope this was useful to you and you can reach out to us at www.chodrilaw.com and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye.